Ready? We want to welcome you this morning to our third week in the series of the names of God. Today's name is Jehovah. Everyone say Jehovah. Jehovah. Nissi. The Lord is my banner. And yes, he is. Reading from Exodus 17, chapter. That's right after Genesis, Exodus 17 and verse 7. So he called the name, and that's Moses, the place Massah and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel, because they tempted the Lord and they quarreled among themselves and they complained. I know that's not you and I, right? Is the Lord among us or not? And right there we would lose hope. But these very people are going to win a battle in a moment. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek, because tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Someone say, the rod of God. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when his hands began to go down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on each side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua, first time he's mentioned, defeated Amalek and the people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial and recount it in the hearing of Joshua. That's because Joshua would be tapped soon that I will blot out the remembrance of Amalek. And Moses built an altar and called its name, the Lord is my banner. For he said, the Lord has given us victory. Second Corinthians 2 and 14, thanks be to God who always, someone say always, causes us to triumph. Not just sometimes, but always. Look at your neighbor and say, the Lord is my banner. And I will have victory in the valley. Before I pray, I want to give this commercial that uh, I told Brother Perry when he comes, he and I at the transition are going to sing the duet of the old school song I broke out in last week. He's God in the Father. So Tanner, get those drums ready. It's going to be great. How many know he's God in the Father and he's God in the Son? He's God in the Holy Ghost. He's God all three in one. Give him a shout of praise. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Come, Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Speak to my brothers and sisters. Speak what I don't even say. Come, sir, and let heaven be glorified in the name of Jesus be exalted. But let your people be challenged to be triumphant. In Christ's name, and everyone said, amen and amen. We're in the theory or the series of the names of God and the theory. Psalms 9 and 10 says, and those who have known your name, Lord, will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Knowing the name of the Lord is powerful. Proverbs 18 and 10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous, and they are All right now, getting to know God and his names is crucial. He reveals something about himself. Jehovah, uh, Rohai, our shepherd. Jehovah, Goel, our redeemer, was last week. Today is Jehovah. It is a compound name, Nisi. You know, athletes, athletes often distinguish themselves with combination names. Hank Aaron was known as Hammering Hank. The title was given him when he bypassed Babe Ruth with a record of 714 home runs. Come on, give it up for Hammer and Hank. Hank Aaron. The compound names are usually given for God in strategic moments. And what the Lord is revealing to us that in times of hard times, in times that we need a breakthrough, he gives us his compound name. So by those names, we can know him better and more clearer. The banner, the Lord is my banner. Banners were often like a flag that flown. They were like a signet. In medieval times, they were come to known. If you would watch them marching over a hill, the Romans would come with a big signet, a banner, that they were Romans. The other, the Greeks, would come with a banner. And what they were saying, 
saying is, this is who we stand with. Uh, this is who we are for. This is who we are a part of. I'm glad that the universe, the principalities and the powers and the rulers in high places see flying above the church of Jesus Christ. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner. We do not march. We do not war by ourselves, but the Lord's name flies high above us. Jehovah Nisi is his name, and the Lord is my banner. Someone give him a shout of praise this morning. <laughs> Countries are known by symbols. On September 14th, 1844, a gentleman on a boat eight miles from a Fort McHenry watched as that fort was battled all night by the British. And he was afraid that United States of America, first formed a new nation, would lose their power and lose their identity as Britain bombed them over and over again. But as the sun came up in the morning, Francis Scott Key saw still flying vaguely and thinly from Mount Henry was the flag of the United States of America. And he pinned those words and the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night when the sun came up that our flag was still there and America was still alive. Give Jesus praise for that. And through dark nights of our souls and hard trials, we can look to see that Jehovah Nisi, our banner, is for us and not against us. You see, the children of Israel traveled with a pillar of smoke, a pillar of fire, and a cloud of glory. They were protected by him, but also they were protected by the name of Jehovah Nisi. Psalm 60 and 4 is a promise to you and I. It says, for you, O Lord, have raised a banner for those who fear you, a rallying point in the time of attack. Someone say amen. Josh and Matt, would you come help me, Josh Herring, and pick up the ends of that banner and walk that way and face it. You see, what's so curious is in the spiritual realm, if it were, there is, in the medieval times, a trumpet would sound in the time of war, and that trumpet would alert the troops. You, we need to regroup. Everyone come together. Come back to the rallying point and they would gather toward their flag. Come back and let's regroup because it's intense out there. What I want to tell you that's what Sunday is like. In the spirit realm, there's a sound that comes of a trumpet. <laughs> And it says, rally to the church. Rally to your community of faith. Rally to your brothers and sisters. Regroup and remember, it is King of kings and Lord of lords that you serve. You're out there in the world, but the trumpet of the Lord sounds and says, gather yourself. And someday, that same trumpet will be heard from the east to the west to the north to the south. And it'll be the voice that will wake the dead. And so shall we be caught up with the Lord forever. Somebody give him a shout of praise. Hang with me, brothers, for a moment. This is the banner. This is the signaling rally of come together with your brothers and sisters and never forget that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm going to keep them up here just for a minute. When we look at the Israelites in Exodus 17, they're a group of people who felt greatly discouraged. We know this because of the amount of complaining that's going on. David writes in Psalms 106, Psalms 106, who can list the glorious miracles of the Lord, his miraculous deeds. But Israel forgot Everyone say they forgot his many acts of kindness. They rebelled at him at the Red Sea, even though he parted the Red Sea. In the wilderness, they did not wait for his counsel. They forgot all the great things he did in Israel, but God, and he did, bringing them out of Egypt. But I'm telling you today that Moses named the place Massah, the place of testing, Meribah, the place of complaining, because the people of the 
Lord angered Moses and they tested the Lord. They forgot. Now, before you cast a stone their way in times of trouble, is that not you and I? Do we not often forget the last miracle that he performed for us? Do we forget that time we walked the altar and we were saved? Do we forget and we don't trust the Lord, but we test the Lord? We say, God, why are you letting me go through this? God, we come and we worship and we praise. I know I'm not the only one. And then when we hit a battle, we're like, oh, God, where are you? Can I get an amen? Look at your neighbor and say, she might be talking about you this morning. What a marvelous testimony of grace that God uses the very people who were murmuring and grumbling and complaining at Mara and Basap and Baba. They were complaining and grumbling, but this was the same people that God would use on the plains at Remedad to bring victory for the house of the Lord. I love in your lowest moments and my lowest moments that King Jesus said, I'm going to use her. I'm going to raise him up. I'm going to use them for my glory. God is going to let you be seen as powerful and mighty when he gets hold of you. Give him a hand clap of praise this morning. Come on, give him a shout of praise. When the enemy comes against us, the Bible does not say to us, run. It says, go in faith no matter the odds. Our op options during these times or either we trust God's spirit to raise up a banner on our behalf or we surrender to unbelief, giving in to the enemy. And when we surrender to the voice of the enemy, we become his slaves again. The Lord clearly says, I want you to fight a good fight of faith. Now listen, these men that would fight with, Jer with Joshua, I was going to say at Jericho, would fight with him at Rephidim, these men were not experienced. You understand, they, they came out of slavery. They did not have chariots they did not have weapons they were saying we're thirsty and there's no water God I'm not pleased with the Dr. Pepper you gave me I'm not pleased with the iced tea I want the clear water they were complaining and murmuring but this one thing I know when the enemy attacks you and attacks me he is not really attacking you he's attacking your destiny he's attacking Jesus's church he knows Jesus defeated him at a mountain called Calvary so he cannot pull Christ from the throne but he wars against the church to bring you hostage when the Iranians took our hostages and President Reagan was put in and he put an end to that thing that the former president couldn't they did that because they knew we set our love on our people Americans love their people that's why they take people hostage I want to tell you something Thing. The enemy knows one simple strategy is to get you to give up on Jesus. He can't change Jesus, but he'll want to make you terrified. He'll want to make you run. He has lifted up his hand, Moses says in the book of Deuteronomy. The Amalekites lifted their hand toward the throne room of God. I'm going to tell you something this morning. Jesus prayed over you and over me. Father, all the those that you gave me, I will not lose one of them. Today, Jesus is praying for you, no matter the adversary against you, that you would not be lost. Give King Jesus a praise. <laughs> Jehovah Nisi is our banner. Thank you, gentlemen. Just lay it down. Would you give them a hand? And we'll move on to other parts of the message. Look at your neighbor and say, victory in the valley. And here they are, the Israelites, and they suffered an unwanted attack. I don't know about you, but um, the Amalekites came and fought against them at Rephidim. I don't know about you, but it'd be great if after a good night of sleep, you'd get hit with something. Come on. It'd be great after a big old meal when your belly is full. You ever been hangry? I was hangry the other day, and people driving all around me were getting on my last nerve. I mean, I was so hangry. And I thought, Lord said, you need to eat, girl. And I, said, I pulled over to Zeke's and ran in there and got some salmon. Come on, somebody. Because I just not had time to eat. But here's the deal. We just think, I could fight this if I'd had a good night's rest. 
But here they are straight out of Egypt and they get attacked after, out of the gate of the Red Sea. We do a disservice to people when we tell them, hey, you come to Jesus, you'll never have a trial again. You come to Jesus, you'll never have trouble again. Just come worship at our church and you'll have no battles. Oh, no, you come worship at our church and you'll definitely have battles. Come on. You go worship at First Presbyterian, First Methodist, First Catholic. You go worship at First Church of God, First Church of Christ. You will have battles because the Word says all who live godly will be persecuted and trials will come. But what we need to say is you'll be better facing the trials in Jesus, for Jesus, and with Jesus. Because if you're in Jesus, you're for Jesus and you're with Jesus you're going to have victory because Jesus is in the midst of your battle someone give Jehovah Nishi a shout of praise this morning I love this illustration I love it because sometimes we don't know if we're up or down and what is our standard our standard is Jehovah Nisi. they also called a banner a standard my standard is not my emotions my emotions feel a thousand different ways about a thousand different things all day. Today, I love tacos. Tomorrow, I hate tacos. Today, I love that new green car I got tomorrow. I can't stand this green car. I don't have a green car, just Megan. If you do, I'm not being offensive. <laughs> We're so fickle. I love her. She's my BFF. Boy, I've had to get between people like that that hated each other in six months. Come on. Because emotions are fickle. Psalms 1 says, don't take counsel with the ungodly. And there's nothing more ungodly than your personal emotions and your flesh. And if you counsel yourself how you feel about things, I feel, I feel, you will feel yourself out into the desert. Can I get an amen? But the step, come on, give Jesus a hand because that's a good one. But the standard is Christ and his word. Our standard is Jesus. He is our Nisi. He is our banner. In a chaotic and confusing world, he is it. The amazing thing is that Moses goes up on the mountain. A lot of people like to put this about pastors. That's not what this is about this morning. And really don't think that's what it's about. I'll show you what I believe it's about. It's about the church of Jesus Christ. But the same staff he goes up and he raises it on the mountain while Joshua and the soldiers that used to be slaves are down fighting in the valley. This staff is the same one that when God said, Moses, throw down your staff when he was up against Pharaoh's magicians. And when he did, it became a snake. And then God said to him, and it ushered in the plagues of Egypt. You see, at that point, what's so powerful about Jehovah Nissi, the Lord says to himself, says to Pharaoh, forgive me, after all the plagues, Pharaoh, I could have struck you. You ever told God, just kill them and tell them somebody else they died? Come on, somebody. God says, you know what, Pharaoh? I could have lifted my hand and struck you and all of your people off the face of the planet. I could have snapped my fingers would be my paraphrase. And I could have removed you. But this is what the Lord says. But I spared you, Pharaoh, for a special purpose. I'm going to tell you that enemy at the workplace against you has been spared for a special purpose. That thing that you're going through has been spared for a special purpose. That trial that you're going through, you say, God, let it in. Get that purpose person out of my life move them to Argentina come on somebody and God says I'm not moving anybody to Argentina no I'm going to keep them alive for a purpose and what God said is to show the world my power God knew he would keep Pharaoh and Egypt alive so he could raise his rod the rod of Elohim the great almighty God over those things I'm going to tell you today can you believe that your problem will give God glory can you believe that your trial will give God glory can you believe that your enemy will be forced to see you give God glory can you believe just as the disciples said to Jesus one day as they walked why was this man born blind why was he born did his mama sin did his daddy sin did his aunt Betty or uncle Bob isn't it funny I've got this staff this is this is just is, this is a this is a problem for y'all because I'm going to beat it I, he said why was this man born blind who sinned isn't it funny how we become judgment authority wonder why they're going through that Betty oh I bet it's what they did here and what they did there 
And Jesus Christ responded to the disciples and he said, nobody sinned. This man was born blind. They didn't make give glory to Jesus Christ and show his power. I'm going to tell you the things that you're going through. Can you believe it when he moves the unmovable in your life? Can you believe it when he crosses the uncrossable? Can you believe it when he does the impossible? People will say when they see God split your own Red Sea, when they see God annihilate your personal Pharaoh, they will say there is no way they could have pulled themselves out of that. Only God could have rewritten that story. Only God could have given that victory. Only God could have given that healing. Only God could have healed that marriage. Only God could have brought that prodigal child home. Only God could have turned the battle at the gate. Only God could have given victory when the world said there was no victory. If you believe it, give King Jesus a shout of praise in this house. When the Amaleks attacked Moses, the Amalekites attacked Moses, attacked the people, Moses knew they could not run. There was no way to run. There was no way to imagine this is not happening. I mean, in a perfect world, we're such creative, imaginative people, at least me and a lot of my friends are. <laughs> what I mean is some of your left brain thinkers, I'm right and left, very heavy on the right. That's how I get creative. But you know, we'd like to imagine this is not happening. You can put a, something over your head. You can hide like an ostrich in the sand. But what you're going through, you're going through. And the best thing is do is keep your eyes on Jehovah Nisi, your banner. And say, Lord, I know you're going to turn this. Because I'm going to tell you something. The Amalekites came to destroy. And that's what they're doing in your life right now, the things against you. Listen to me. It's to go against God. And the second thing is to destroy you, discourage you, and to dishearten you. If it is right now Amalek attacking you, are you going through some temptation or desire is your enemy trying to lure you into something you don't need to do or plague you with guilt or put your family under attack or use tactics? Today, I say to you that Jehovah Nisi is your God. Have you ever felt like you were battling a battle that you could not win? You feel you're unqualified, unskilled, and outnumbered. That's me every day and overpowered. But the Lord says, lift up the banner of Jehovah Nisi. Lift up the name of Jesus Christ. I speak the name of Jesus over my family. I speak the name of Jesus over the city. I speak the name of Jesus over my personal referendum. I speak the name of Jesus, the name that makes soldiers out of slaves. The name of Jesus that takes the outnumbered, the outrank, and raises them up to be mighty warriors. Somebody give King Jesus a shout of praise in this house. The Amaclex were, I'm going to say their name a thousand different ways. I'm so glad Perry's not here this morning. The Amalekites. <laughs> Amalekites, they didn't play fair. The enemy doesn't play fair. He doesn't say, when you get that really good night's rest and you're feeling so good about yourself, I'm going to whisper something in your ear. When you're feeling powerful and you just got extra money in your bank account, I'm going to whisper something strong in your ear. When you got that good report from the doctor, I'm going to really whisper, no, it's when all those things are reversed. The Amalekites were like guerrilla warfare. Listen, that's why God hated them. And I'm, that's why God hates the things that come against you. It says that when they came out of the Red Sea, that was the first people that fought them. Israel didn't have weapons. They didn't have, but the Amalekites had chariots and strong horses. In fact, this is what Moses says in Deuteronomy 25. Never forget what the Amalekites did to you when you came from Egypt. They attacked you when you were exhausted and weary. They struck you down. And those who were straggling, someone say straggling, Behind. That meant they had no fear of God, is what the Lord said. They were nomads. The Amalekites were nomads. They were fierce and ferocious. They wanted to stop Israel while Israel's still shaking off Egypt. I'm going to tell you, new believers, you wonder why we shield you because we know you're still shaking off the yesterday of Egypt. Come on, somebody. They wanted to stop the destiny of God's people. And those are at the back of the line, the feeble, the ones lagging. That's why all over the world today, pastors would tell their churches, stay together, stay in your community. Don't lag behind. Don't get over here in the desert and pull down your shades and sit home and drink beer and ice cream or whatever your little thing is and stay out of the house of God. Because when you lag to the side or you lag to the other side, 
or you lag to the back, you become an open target against guerrilla warfare of the enemy. But there is strength in numbers. One can turn a thousand to flight. Two can turn ten thousand. Greater are we when we are together in Jesus' name. Amen. But they came. But you know, here's the thing. If those soldiers had looked in the mirror, they'd have probably still seen slaves. I mean, they went through the plagues and all that, but if they looked in the mirror, they would have seen something that God did not see. God saw mighty warriors. God saw, when you look in the mirror, you might think, all I see is my weakness. You might think, all I see is my challenges. All I see, listen, I'm 61. I was ordained when I was 30. I was raised by the best ministers in the world. And I say these things with honesty because I fight those same battles of mind and spirit and everyone great in the kingdom I know do. They look in the mirror at times and see their inadequacies. They see their inabilities. They, they, it becomes overwhelming. If you ever, in a moment, the enemy overwhelms you and says you're not up for it, you better go to the mirror. And you better say, Jehovah Nisi is my banner. If the Lord is for me, he's more than the world against me. I wish I had a keyboardist from my African-American brothers because I just heard an organ play. And come on, somebody, and give Jesus a praise in this house. When you feel that way, because they saw one thing, but the enemy saw a people of purpose. The enemy saw a people with God's promises that are yes and amen in Christ. Christ Jesus. They saw themselves as slaves that had just come out of Egypt, but the Amalekites saw them as the people that God parted the Red Sea for. The Amalekites saw them as the people that God had said, my promises are upon them. So I want to tell you today, the enemy is fighting your destiny. He's fighting what you will bring about. It's not over the past. It is over the future and you are a winner because Jehovah Nisi is with you. Give him a shout of praise in this house. God said, throw down that, that rod, Moses, and pick it back up. And when he picked it back up, he said, I believe this is your rod, God. And it became Elohim's rod. Sometimes you have to say to your gift and your talent when you feel overwhelmed, you know what? I lay my gift down. It doesn't mean I walk away from what I'm doing. But I always say to the Lord, this is your word. This is your church. This is your anointing. Anything you've given me, I've picked it back up by your grace. And it is your strength that flows through this gift. It is your strength that flows through this talent. And you've got to say to yourself, you know what? I'm going to lay down this gift for a second. It's a process. It's a lifelong process. And I'm going to pick it back up and say, when I feel overwhelmed about my gift, my talent, my job, whatever the Lord has called me to be in my community... I'm going to lift it up this time saying this is not the rod of Rhonda. This is not the rod of Kim, of Todd, of David, of Keith. This is the rod of Elohim. And what he has anointed, he will put power in. Somebody give him a shout of praise. I love that, Josh Casper, if you'll come and help me. Not, not near done, but if you'll come and help me. Moses is on the hill with the rod. And every time he raised his staff high, Joshua and those soldiers made out of slaves. What a, what a message that would be someday. Soldiers out of slaves. It's basically all of us. When his arms got tired and he started lowering it, Joshua started losing the battle and the Amalekites were winning. The path indicated that the battle was not totally physical. Hang with me till we can get here and somewhere in just a moment. It was a strange supernatural alliance. We call it synergy in theology. It means God and mankind work together. On one hand, Joshua and the Israelites were soldiers and they had a role to play in the valley. Everyone say in the valley. But on the other hand, the outcome of the battle didn't depend solely on their efforts. Can anyone say hallelujah? Aren't you glad that whatever you're walking through or whatever you're believing God for is not dependent upon your effort, your ability, 
your striving, it meant they could only achieve victory as long as Moses kept the rod of God in the air. You see, there's two responses I've seen as a pastor. You see, because there's a mix of physical and spiritual. First response is, I'm going to trust God to fix everything, lay on the couch and eat bonbons. Glory to the King. I'm going to binge watch Netflix till Jesus brings me a miracle. I'm going to sleep like a bear in hibernation until King wakes me up. And then he's going to say, hey, fixed it for you. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Wake me up when it's all over. <laughs> That's not right. And the second one is seek to win a battle yourself in the valley with your skill. I got to fix this. I got to fix this with your willpower, with your determination, with your resources to overcome what you're facing. All the while neglecting God, which is an extreme. The truth is in the middle. The valley and the mountain work together. You see, for victory, you have responsible to do what you can do, to reach what you can reach, to pray what you can pray, to forgive what you can forgive, to serve what you must serve, to make peace where you can make peace. You were to do all of that. You have a responsibility to address the challenge. But unless God supports and engages you with the fight, you will not be enough. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 says, He who, made us, who was made to be no sin, who had no sin, was made to be sin. And we, everyone say we, working together with Him. That synergy, we work together with Him. The key is to find the balance between what goes on in the valley and we're responsible for and what God is responsible for. You see, we are not enough in our own sufficiency. What was happening on the ground as Joshua fought with a sword, the victory was being secured on the mountain where an appeal to heaven was going forth. I'm going to tell you, you better make your appeal to heaven. You better tell the Lord through prayer, this is what I need you to do. This is what I need you to fix. Because if you spend more time talking about and focusing on what you're fighting than focusing on God, you will not win. And the battle will go against you. Fight in the valley with the appeal in the heaven. Somebody give King Jesus us a praise in this house. Come on. It's a statement I love just the other night. It's approaching a year of my husband's home going and the Lord told me something very holy. I'll tell you when I talk about angels, the Lord of hosts, but not today. But he woke me up from a dream and told me something so powerful. And I quote it every time this just overwhelmed me. Sweet. And the other night it's just started to overwhelm me. And I just did what the song said. And I knelt down. And I lifted my hands. Because you see, this may be uncomfortable for you in the church house. But then do it in your private chamber. Do it in your house. Because this is a sign to the kingdoms of heaven and the kingdoms of darkness. I am not alone. I am not in this alone. And I began to worship. And I began to praise. And I began to magnify the Lord. And then I stood and I kept worshiping because he told me, the angel of my presence will spare you this week. And every time it comes, begin to lift your hands. I'm going to tell you something. He who kneels before God can stand before anyone. He who worships before God can stand before anyone. Don't try to stand before someone one on your own kneel down worship stand and wave the banner of Jehovah Nisi you see he's our banner and we have supernatural power it doesn't matter how good you are how much you try all your good efforts will result in nothing if you don't say Jesus is my banner so before you give up look up and fix your eyes on King Jesus Jehovah Nisi is his name someone give him a praise in this house as long as you say God is victorious in my life as long as you declare it and I'm telling you first time out might be like old little Zerubbabel when the prophet Zechariah said shout grace at the mountain 
I kind of see Zerubbabel as a governor of very distinguished grace, grace, grace. You know, prophets, you know, we're like, shout grace. Say it loudly. Say it 17 times. Say it forward and backwards. I mean, that's pastor of prophets and kings because we're made to be your cheerleader, your encourager. And finally, I believe that Zerubbabel in his little distinguished Middle Eastern suit lifted up his hand and said, Grace! You see, as long as you say over yourself, it might start like, God is victorious in my life. God's going to give me victory. Hey, I've said it that way too. But you keep saying it until you can say, God is victorious in my life. I've called on my belly and said it. I've said it through so much crying, I can't barely speak. But I said, you are victorious. And the word of confession is in your mouth and it brings forth a victory. But as long as you drop your hands and you say, I'm defeated, the enemy has me down, then you will be defeated. But when you focus and lift up your eyes and lift up your mouth and you begin to praise, I am a winner in Christ Jesus. I will not be defeated in Christ Jesus. This battle may be raging. I may look like I'm losing, but you haven't seen the best of what Jehovah Nisi shall do. You have not seen his greatest days. Somebody give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because you will conquer. Overcomer is a powerful word. It won't be a piece of cake. You're not supposed to wrestle humans. If that's what you're doing, you're doing it wrong. We wrestle with not with flesh and blood. Principalities and powers. You will never win in your own strength, but you can win only through God's strength. It's not in you. The word overcomer is powerful. You are a winner. Listen, you will overcome because 1 John 5 and 4, whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You will overcome, and you will anticipate victory because Romans 8 and 31 says, if God be for us, he's more than against us. You will overcome because Romans 8 and 37 says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You will overcome because of Romans 16 and 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. You will overcome because of 1 Corinthians 15 and 57, but thanks be to God who all always leads us to victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. You will overcome because God is able to make all grace abound to you at all times and every way. You will overcome because Corinthians 12 and 9, God says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. You will overcome because Ephesians 1 and 11, God works out everything in conformity with His will. You will overcome because of Ephesians 3 and 20. Now Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think you will overcome because of Philippians 4 19 my God shall supply all my needs in Christ Jesus you will overcome my last scripture till I go on because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world give him a shout of praise in this house Moses, as long as the staff was held up high, there was victory. But the Bible says his hands grew weary. What I love is that Aaron and Hur didn't say, can't believe you're tired, Moses. We shouldn't say that to our brothers and sisters. Can't believe you're weary. If you were just stronger, you'd work your arms more, brother. But Aaron and Hur brought him support. He got tired and they stepped in. You see, brothers and sisters in the Lord, we are to support support one another in the word. You see, it's important to surround yourself with people that will fight in the battles with you. Brother Gerald Pippinger, Christiane, would you come forth and help me? You see, when we lift up this rod as a church family, Christiane, come help me. Christiane asked me something Wednesday night that no one's asked me for a year. Now, people have prayed for me. Take the very end. Brother Gerald, if you'll take the other end, we'll move this. Christiane asked me, Pastor, they came from California. They're such a gift. Give them a hand. Gerald and Peggy have been with us for a long time. And Christiane said, Pastor, boy, this is so much easier because y'all are so much taller. Woo. I'm loving this. Christiane said, how can I pray for you, Pastor? I was almost shocked that she asked me that. And I told her. Brother Gerald was the first written communication to me after Pastor went to heaven. 
I save his words in a file on my desk and I read it because he's a great man of the word and of the anointing. And he spoke life into me. You see, as a body, this isn't about me. This is about the body. Tina, come grab between me and Christy Ann. Come on. Chris Vernon, come grab between me and Gerald Pippincher. You see, as a body, we lift each other up. We bear each other's burdens. We don't have to go through stuff by ourselves. We put our hands to each other and we say, I refuse to let you go through this by yourself. I refuse. I will hold you up. Joel, come on up and grab that other long pole and get in the middle. You see, Joel's a new believer and we're not going to leave him to himself. When someone comes to Jesus, they're not on their own. But as he lifts it up in the middle, Pastor Todd, come grab one end. Josh Herring, come and grab the other end. Kelly Carson, come Come get between them. Gail Combs, come get between the other side over there. You see, as the body of Christ, intercessors, musicians, people that stack chairs, we come together. We are never alone, but we lift up the rod of God. Over 30 times the New Testament church is called to bear each other's burdens. You are not alone. You are being held up. Somebody is praying for you. Somebody is standing with you. Somebody is supporting you. In the midnight hour, someone is pushing you through. This church will never be by itself. Go ahead and stand if you can and give him praise this morning. Come on, give him praise. Just stay there, guys. Come on, give him praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This This is so powerful to me to see it. Coming to a year I've been lead pastor, it's people like this holding up the pole with me, being strong with me. You are never alone, Moses. In the community of faith, someone is standing with you. May They may not remember to tell you, but they're praying for you. They're supporting you. You are not alone. Give King Jesus one more praise. I'm going to leave you all there for just a minute. Stand with you. I'm almost done. But I want to tell you something. Isaiah 11 and 1 says, There shall come forth a rod out of the stump of Jesse. And he will be called the wonderful, hallelujah, the counselor, the mighty God. Out of King David's lineage came him, Yeshua, Hamashiach, or Jesus, the anointed one. He now is the rod that's lifted up over the earth. He is the rod that is lifted up over you. This rod is being held by humans, but don't take it uh, granted for a moment that there aren't angels holding up this rod, and there's not heavenly hosts open up this rod, and the Word of God is opening this rod. Someone give King Jesus a praise this morning before we finish. Y'all just hang with me. Hey, Moses did it. You can do it too. Come on. At Daystar, they have a cliche. Don't be invited into Pastor Rhonda's testimonies or on, on stage because they, they say it with joy. You'll be up there for the whole time. Here's what I want to say to you. If you focus real quick so we can make this about Christ in this last moment. Victory was in the valley. In Rephidim, God gave victory because of the appeal to heaven. And Joshua fought by the strength of the heavens. Thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, today you may say, I'm not a conqueror, Pastor Rhonda. I'm not righteous. If anyone in this room knew what was really going on in this brain, hey, we're all happy we can't read our minds. Come on, somebody. I'm not the best Christian. I've sinned. I've been angry. I've been weak. I'm just... But I want to tell you something. Jesus took all of that upon Himself and He gave you righteousness. I love the comparison that Marilyn Hickey made, that when a lamb dies, the shepherd removes the lamb's skin and he places it on an orphan little sheep that is alone and doesn't have a mama. The mother lamb who loves her baby smell and lost it will find the orphan lamb 
and it will smell like her baby and she will adopt it and raise it as her own. I want to tell you something in the same way King Jesus' righteousness clothed us and he clothes us with his sacrifice and he makes us smell like him. So when God sees us, when God smells us, when we walk, God said, I see my son. For Isaiah said in 61, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful for he hath clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself or a bride adorns himself. So have I been clothed in King Jesus. Give him praise today. Jehovah Nisi. I'm going to tell you something before I pray with you. They're going to keep holding it. You've been given everything you need for victory in Jesus. Jehovah Nisi goes before you. He comes behind you. He is that standard lifted above you. And the world sees it, but you've got to confess it. Don't ever say you're defeated. Don't ever say it's over for you. Speak it, because I want to tell you something. That victory was in the valley because on the mountain there was an appeal to heaven. I'm going to tell you, I've gone with Perry and Pam Stone to Israel. I've seen Golgotha the hill where Jesus was crucified, where he made intercession. And because Jesus walked up that hill and gave his life, there is victory in the valley called earth because the appeal has been made to heaven. I want to tell you something. Had it not been for the old rugged cross had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary had it not been for a man named Jesus your soul and my soul would be forever lost the standard has been lifted Jehovah Nissi is his name give him a praise today come on give him a praise today let me say this to you and then I'm gonna let them put that down I'm gonna pray over you Moses ended this by building an altar Sometimes you just need to go out and build an altar. I believe as he put those stones upon stones, he was saying, you helped me with the first plague. I mean, he's probably talking to himself like me when I'm out in my prayer garden. And then you helped me with this. The devil keeps telling me, you can't help me with this, but I know you can. And then you helped me with this. And then he builds the altar up and he calls it Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. Because when I was pushed back and about to fall, the Lord sustained me. When there was no hope for victory, and the Amalekites were chasing our forlorn back at the back of the line, you gave us victory in the valley. I want to ask you this morning, what altar do you need to build this morning? What altar do you need to build before the Lord in prayer, before we leave this place? What altar do you need to build by saying, King Jesus, I thank you for what you did here, and I thank you for what you're going to do. I praise you. What do you need to believe him for today? As they put down these rods and the worship team comes up, we're going to sing when you walk into the room, and I want everyone that can just to come and stand in the altars we're going to pray over you we're going to believe God for something powerful in your life before we leave this morning would you come now all over this place just come just for a moment it's 11:58. you got a minute right now come on down I want you to come down and think what do I need to thank God for what altar do I need to build right now and what do I need to say thank you Jesus and then what do I need to believe you for Lord Jesus if you would come Come, come and just get behind them. Just get behind them. Father, in the name of Jesus, you just start singing when you're ready. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you are Jehovah Nisi. I thank you that you are the Lord, our banner. I thank you that you are lifted above us. I thank you that victory in this valley called earth is because of King Jesus is at the right hand of God. And you sat down, Lord, just like Moses sat down to show your work was completed at Calvary. So, Lord, forgive us if we've been operating from a place of defeat and let us operate from a place of victory Lord this morning we want to believe you for some impossible things we might be going we might feel like the Amalekites are chasing us from behind but Lord you are before us and behind us and you are with us so Jehovah Nisi we lift up the banner to your name to your name in Jesus name now I want you to just reach over put your hand on the person next to you and pray for them as we we worship. Jesus, Come on. Minister to each other. Jesus, we love you, Jesus. We can't get enough. Can't get enough. All this is for you. Just pray for Jesus, that person to your side on either side. Pray for the victory they're believing for. Pray for the salvation you they're believing for. Pray for strength in the valley till they see the valley. the victory on the mountain. 
Lord Jesus, we thank you that your name is our banner. We thank you that the word is our banner. We thank you that our worship is our banner. We thank you that our praise is our banner and our confession that the Lord is with us and not against us. We worship you, King Jesus. We honor you, King Jesus. We praise you for victory, for overcoming battles. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you are doing and what you have done, that you will finish that which you started. We thank you, King Jesus. We thank you, King Jesus. We worship you, Father, for this person I'm praying for right now. Give them hope. Breathe life into them. Breathe the battle sounds of victory into their very soul, Lord. Let them be reminded they are not alone when they feel alone, Lord. Let them remember people are praying for them, standing with them that they can't even see or do not know, and that heaven is holding up the rod. The angels of God are holding up the rod, and the power of the Holy Spirit is holding up the rod. Hallelujah, Lord, for yours is the glory. Yours is the power. Yours is the kingdom. Let's sing it out now in praise. We love you. Sing it to him in this moment. is his name. King Jesus is glorious. Forever he will reign. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Now would you give him the best praise this morning? Come on, let him hear it. Let him hear it. Hallelujah. King Jesus, hallelujah. We bless your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jehovah Nisi, your banner, your standard. That rallying cry, just remember it's to come back. You may not hear a physical trumpet. We don't, unless I play it for you. But in the supernatural, it rallies. Go with your brothers and sisters. Go where you're appreciated. If the enemy tells you you're not loved or accepted here or anywhere that you gather in community, no, that's a statement of fact that you are, and that you are precious and valuable. These people I called up here, I could have called up every single one of you. You're valuable. You're anointed. You hold up the rod of this house. I think about my sweet spiritual son over there, Chuck Martin. A little trivia in the early days of harvest, Ron Kaufman, you'll love it. He and Terry Lee asked Pastor Hank after one of our first services if he would leave me to them in his will. <laughs> And uh, as their mama, I'm sure. But uh, he was one of the first calls it made to me. I got you back, Pastor. I'm here. I got my own family. I don't want you to my will. But I just want you to know. Ah, oh, I love you. As a mama, I know. But just so many. The Sallies who aren't here and so many other people. You're precious. John Mizell, who's here this morning, who's just been a strength to us. You're valuable. You're needed to hold up that rod for someone. All of us together make an incredible community. I pray you'll go forth in peace this week and join victory. And when you feel a little bit of that unk of defeat, say, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. There are more with me than there are against me. You are loved, Church of the Harvest. We'll see you Wednesday night. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May His cause His face to shine upon you. And as Pastor Hank would say, May your dreams be in color, and may you go in the grace and peace of Jesus Christ, who is your banner. I love you, Church of Harvest. God bless you as you go make a great week.